Hi everyone, my name is Amitesh. I'm a research mathematician. I've received a PhD in pure mathematics at Princeton University and I've also received a university-wide faculty teaching award at Princeton University. And in this video I'm going to show you how to think about a really cool calculus math proof right from the basics. You don't need to have any introduction to mathematical proofs. This video is going to serve it for you. It's going to be a continuous function f from r to r. f of 1 is equal to a which is a non-zero constant. f of x plus y is equal to f of x times f of y prove that f is unique. So the non-zero constant can be anything. It can be 2, 3, pi, etc. We want to show there's only one continuous function of this property. And once we've proven that there's one continuous function of this property, we know the function has to be the famous power function f of x is equal to a to the x. So here we know, of course, this function satisfies the properties that a to the 1 is equal to a, and a to the x plus y is a to the x times a to the y. Okay, so why is f got to be, why does it have got to be this function a power x? So we're going to prove this rigorously and let's talk through the thinking process while we construct the proof. So the first thing is we know what f of 1 is and we want to find out all the values of f basically because we want to show that f is unique. So how do we start? We start off with some simple values using this law we have here. We know how f of a sum of things is. So we know what f of 1 is, let's just add f of 1 plus 1 plus 1 etc and see what we get. So the first thing we do is we find f of 2 for example, that's equal to f of 1 plus 1 which is equal to f of 1 times f of 1. And of course f of 1 we know to be a, so therefore this is going to equal to a squared. Okay, so that's number 1. Now using induction if you like or otherwise, if you don't know what induction is, don't worry, we can actually find what f of n is for any natural number n. So for any positive integer n if you like. So f of n is going to equal to f of 1 plus 1 plus dot 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 plus 1 and you're going to have n ones here, so this is n times. And by our law for f, we know that f of 1 plus 1 plus 1 n times is f of 1 power n. So we can work this out to be f of 1 power n, which is just going to equal to a to the n. So we found what f of any natural number is. The next step is how do we find out other values of f? So for example, what is f of 0 going to be? Okay, so let's play around with this law. Okay, so I encourage you to try to play around with this. You know, pause the video and play around with this and see how many values you can find, okay? At some point, we're going to use the continuity, but not yet. So the first thing is what is f of 0 going to be? Well, we know this law, f of x plus y, we understand. Let's make one of the variables 0 and then try to understand that. So f of 0, let's say what is f of 0 plus 1, okay? Simple enough f of 0 plus 1 is going to equal to f of 0 times f of 1. But f of 0 plus 1 is just f of 1 of course, so we know that f of 1 is equal to f of 0 times f of 1, but f of 1 is a non-zero constant by assumption. If we didn't assume that then the zero function would work, just being zero everywhere. So we're assuming this and therefore what we get is we can cancel off the f of 1 from both sides and therefore get that f of 0 is equal to 1. So that is pretty cool. We now know f of every non-negative integer. The next step is to figure out what is f of the negative integers. How does that work? Okay, so I'm going to make a general observation which will allow us to find f of negative anything actually. And the observation is as follows, and I want you to think about what we would do now that we know f of 0 to actually execute this. So how would we find f of minus n, right? If n is a natural number, how do we find f of minus n? Well, let's multiply f of minus n with f of n. Okay, we know how to multiply different values of f because we know that f of x times f of y is f of x plus y. So f of minus n times f of n is going to equal to f of minus n plus n, which is just going to equal to f of 0, which we've just found out is 1. So therefore, we know that f of minus n is going to equal to 1 over f of n, which is equal to 1 over a to the n. Okay, so it's equal to 1 over a to the n, which is just a to the minus n. Right, so in fact we've matched up with a to the x for all integers. Okay, so that's number one. We've shown that f of x is equal to a to the x for all integers x. Um, this is just a mathematical proof of that. We've just played around with the axioms in some sense. The axioms of the hypothesis being this. Now the next step is how do we figure out more values of f? You know, that, that itself is not enough to reconstruct f. So here's a cool property. So I'm going to state a lemma. Okay, so I'm going to first show you something and then I'm going to ask you to think about it, pause the video and this is going to be something to think about and then I'm going to state a lemma that will handle the difficulty I'm going to show you. So we're going to find out, let's say we want to find out f of half, right? Well, we know f of 1. Let's play around with this, this kind of property. We can say that f of half times f of half is equal to f of half plus half which is f of 1, right? And f of 1 we know is a, that's kind of the hypothesis, we've said this is a. 
So therefore, f of half squared is equal to a, which therefore means that f of half is equal to plus minus the square root of a, right? It could be root a, it could be minus root a. But in fact, I'm telling you here, it's actually only going to be one value. It's not going to be minus root a, it's going to be plus root a. I want you to think about why that is. Why does it have to be that? Can you find an elegant and simple argument using what we know about f? Pause the video, because now I'm going to show you a lemma, and the lemma is that f is always positive. So here's a lemma. The lemma is that f of x is always greater than 0 for all x. That is going to be the lemma. And the proof is actually very elegant and straightforward. Here's the proof. The proof is that f of x is just going to equal to f of x over 2 squared, right? f of x over 2 times x over 2. f of x over 2 times f of x over 2 is f of x by that law. Because x over 2 plus x over 2 is just x. So therefore, f of x is going to equal to f of x over 2 squared, which is going to be at least 0, OK? So therefore, we know that I'm just going to change this to saying f of x is at least 0 for all x. Um, we're going to actually show it's never 0. But let's just keep it at that, because that argument proves that, that it's a perfect square. So therefore, it's always non-negative. Okay? So f is always non-negative. So therefore, we know in the f of half calculation, we can forget the negative sign in the square root. And we can just say it's going to be plus root a. Okay? So I'm just going to erase this here. We can say that f of half, now that we've had the lemma, we're going to erase it. And this is what math is. You know, it's breaking up into these observations, and you kind of find them out over time. Okay, So I'm just sort of telling you the research math process even when you're discovering something new. This is kind of something you're discovering new, even though it's already known. But whenever you're discovering something new, you're trying to break it up into steps, figure out what might help me. You know, what do I need? Is that true? You know, if that's not true, can I make it weaker? You know, maybe I don't need that. I need something slightly weaker than that. That's kind of the game. But here we're kind of showing the kind of neat process, OK? But I'm trying to show you the thinking process while we're going through it. So f of half is equal to the square root of a. And so now what we can do is we can actually find out all f of 1 over n, right? f of 1 over n times dot, 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 times f of 1 over n, n times, right? Just f of 1 over n power n. It's just going to equal to f of 1 by this law here, right? f of x times f of y is f of x plus y. So n, 1 over n plus 1 over n, et cetera, n times is f of 1. So this is just going to equal to f of 1, which is just a. So therefore, we know that f of 1 over n, power n is equal to a. So f of 1 over n is the nth root of a. And we know there is always a unique nth root of a that is a non-negative number. OK, so therefore, we know uniquely what f of 1 over is n is for all n. Now, if you're enjoying this video so far, please check out my channel. I'm trying to help as many people as possible with infinite, elite, free, accessible math education worldwide at all levels. OK, so you know, I've got math at high school, middle school, you know, basic introductory math, high level proof based math, and building a library so everyone can enjoy and benefit from math. So please share with friends, family. You know, if you've got kids, if you have friends who've got kids, if you know younger people who are getting introduced to math, older people who want to start learning math, there's content for everyone on my channel. Now let's just get back into this proof. So we know f of 1 over n for all n. Now what about something like f over 2 thirds? Okay, here's my challenge to you. What is f of 2 thirds going to be? So f of 2 thirds, just as a play around, okay, something which is not 1 over n. Well, we can sort of do some trick, right? So what's the trick going to be? Assume you've got it. You know, drop a comment down below how you find it. f of 2 over 3. Well, I just say f of 2 over 3 times f of 2 over 3 times f of 2 over 3 is just going to equal to f of 2 over 3 times 3, right? 2 over 3 plus 2 over 3 plus 2 over 3 is just f of 2, right? This is the law that we know there, that f of x plus y is f of x times f of y. So therefore, we know that f of 2 over 3 cubed is equal to f of 2, which is equal to a squared. So therefore, f of 2 over 3 is going to equal to a power 2 thirds. OK, so we just take the cube root. Um, and again, it's the same reasoning as before. We know that, well, for cube roots, there's always a unique cube root for every number. But in general, we know for nth roots, there's always a non-negative nth root uniquely for every number. There may be a negative one, but we can discard that because we know f is always non-negative by our lemma. So how do you now figure out f of any rational number? It's the same idea. OK, so I'm just sort of showing you the process. In math, typically, people won't write it out this way. What they will do is they will write out the general argument, and then you see all the special cases, if you like. But the process of discovery is different. You know, you play around with the basic examples to get a feeling for stuff, you know, because 
we're not computers. We, we don't think about things very formally like symbols. We first get the intuition and then we produce the symbols, okay? The cool thing about the symbolic way of writing is it's very formal and there's no room for opinions, okay? So that's kind of the, the ultimate goal, but this is the process. So now we know we can prove another lemma. So this is like, sometimes in math we call this proposition, okay? Proposition is some statement that will help guide us to the final result. So f of p over q is going to equal to um, the qth root of f of p, which is going to equal to a power p over q if p and q are integers. Okay, p and q are integers and um, q is non-zero. So why is this? Well, this is just more or less again the definition that we know that by, so here's the proof, we know by assumption or hypothesis that f of x plus y is f of x times f of y. So therefore f of p over q power q is equal to f of p and therefore we know that f of p over q is going to equal to the qth root of f of p, which is the qth root of a power p, which is equal to a power p over q. Okay, so there's nothing really advanced or fancy in that. Uh, that's going to be the same idea as we've already seen. So we know what f is for every rational number. Okay, that's the cool thing. We've done it purely with this axiom that f of x plus y is f of x times f of y. That's the beauty of math, how far you can go with a single axiom. And now we're going to use the continuity because that's going to be important. The fact that f is continuous, you know, actually, we can't say anything about f on the irrational numbers right now because we, ha we aren't given that information. So, you know, if f was not continuous, we could construct some crazy functions that satisfy this property, maybe, but we're going to use the fact that f is continuous. So my question to you is, if f is not continuous, is this true? Can you find an example of a function that is not a to the x, but that satisfies this property, but is discontinuous, okay? So that's my challenge to you. Drop a comment down below if you can find such a function or if you think such a function still doesn't exist. You know, maybe these axioms are still strong enough to ensure it doesn't exist. What do you think? I'm interested to see your opinions. But now finally we can prove the theorem. So we know that what f is at every rational number, we know that f of x is equal to a to the x for all rational x, right? That's our first statement that we've deduced that we know what f is at every rational number. So therefore, if x is a real number, if x is a real number, you can approximate f by rational numbers, okay? So if x is a real number, find a sequence, okay, find a sequence. I'm just showing you like how to write this rigorously. Find a sequence xn and at least one such that xn approaches x. Okay, so for example, if you have pi, for example, you can take 3, 3.14, 3.1415, etc. Just go on taking more and more decimals. That will approach any real number you like, which is an infinite decimal expansion. Um, you can appro approximate it by rational numbers. And now we know that therefore f of x is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of f of x um, n, right? That's basically continuity because we know that the limit as you approach the point is a value at the point by definition of the fact that f is continuous. So this is equal to limit n goes to infinity of a to the x n and that's just going to equal to a to the x because a to the x is a continuous function. Okay, so that's going to be the end of the result. So therefore, f of x is equal to a to the x for all x. So this symbol here, if you haven't seen it, means for all x. Okay, so this kind of upside down a if you like. That means we're saying for all x. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you loved that video. As I said, I've got infinite free accessible math content at all levels. I'm doing proof-based math, you know, elementary math. I'm a research mathematician. I think about stuff deeply at all levels and I'm presenting math to you the way a mathematician thinks about it. Not just like the way textbooks may present it, but the way, you know, you think about it really mathematically as a researcher, you know, how you go about finding these kinds of um, properties, ideas, how the process, thinking process is not just here's the kind of nice polished argument. I'm taking you on a journey through math. So check out the other content on my channel and please drop a comment down below. I love engagement. As I said, is there a continue, is there a function that's not necessarily continuous that satisfies these properties that is not a to the x? Is there such a function? Drop a comment down below. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are and if you have a proof. Thank you so much for watching and I'm super excited to see you in the next video. Wish you all the best and I will see you soon.